A lot is happening with Xbox right now. It's making for the best kind of clickbaity drama. Unforeseen news that has come out. So let's just go and, and tackle the exclusivity question. Phil Spencer is being cagey and dodgy as usual, and a lot of Xbox fans are left wondering, what is going to happen to their beloved platform? And our hardware is a critical component of that. The absolute best experience. I'm not an Xbox fanboy, but I have some good news for those with an Xbox bias. I don't believe the Xbox box will be going away anytime soon. And to explain my point of view, we have to look at the history of Xbox and why Microsoft got into the console gaming business in the first place. In the 90s, Microsoft was sitting pretty. They commanded a hyper-dominant position in the personal computer market. By the end of 1999, 90% of the world's computers ran off of Windows. Their main competitor at the time was Apple, and they didn't even have a seat at the kiddie table. Microsoft was king. In the 90s, if your house had a den, it was now known as a computer room, and Microsoft owned that room. The Windows team and Office team dominated Microsoft sales, but buried deep within the bowels of Microsoft HQ was a small team that made up the Microsoft Games Group, and they started off making simple games like this. In 1995, longtime Microsoft employee Ed Fries would leave the team making Microsoft Office to lead the games group to be bigger, better, and most importantly, profitable. Under his leadership, they released Flight Simulator, Microsoft Golf, Age of Empires, and more. This ragtag group of cellar dwellers began earning some respect within the company. While the games group was growing, another team of misfits was starting to make their own mark on the company, the DirectX team. In 1994, as Microsoft was gearing up to release Windows 95, Alex St. John was working to make Windows the dominant media and graphics platform. Naturally, he approached some game developers about porting their games from DOS to the new Windows 95 platform. Not many were keen on the idea. DOS gave developers direct access to the computer's hardware. Windows 95 was a large barrier that made it difficult to program games for, since it no longer offered them that direct access. St. John set out to fix that. He recruited a couple of other engineers and made the first DirectX application, known then as Microsoft Games SDK. This would give developers access to the hardware level they were used to having. To help promote this new feature, they had John Carmack from id port Doom to Windows utilizing DirectX technology. By late 1998, the DirectX team would grow and begin to have dreams and ambitions of their own, like making a Microsoft game console the DirectX team would be made of former game developers. One thing they knew about the other consoles was that they were hard to make games for. Architecture was proprietary, and most of the development time was spent trying to figure out how to get a game to run, rather than on designing the actual game. These guys wanted to make a box that would be as easy to make games for as the PC. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, a Japanese company was making some moves. While Microsoft owned the den, Sony owned the living room. They made stereos, TVs, speakers, VCRs, and in 1994, they ventured successfully into the games industry with the PlayStation. $2.99. To get games on their console, Sony formed the Sony Computer Entertainment Group. That word computer would later cause some concern among Microsoft C-suite. March 2nd, 1999, they announced a successor to the PlayStation. The verbiage of the announcement had Microsoft worried. They weren't touting this as simply a game console. They were using words like computer for the living room. The New York Times even ran an article calling the PS2 a Trojan horse. This worried Bill Gates. He tasked the DirectX team to look into the PS2 to see how much of Sony's claims about the prospect of the hardware could be true. Naturally, they used this moment to make a not-so-subtle pitch that Microsoft should make a game console. A couple of weeks after the announcement, Microsoft had their annual executives retreat. For one of the days, any high-level exec could pitch a topic of conversation for breakout discussions. Rick Thompson, head of hardware at the time, asked this question as a jumping off point. What if Sony joined forces with cable, telecom, and internet companies to box us out? This prompted a large group to spend two hours talking about the pros and cons of a game console. Bill Gates was part of this group and he tasked Rick with figuring out the viability of such a console. 
A company-wide memo went out to anyone who was working on anything to do with games and hardware. The DirectX team had a desire to make a console, but another group, the Windows CE group, had already made hardware like this before. That group consisted of former 3DO engineers and the group had worked with Sega to create the operating system for the Dreamcast. The DirectX team and Windows CE team were pitted against each other in a head-to-head -head brawl in front of Bill Gates for a pitch meeting. The DirectX team would win out and pitched Bill a console that would run off a full Windows OS in the living room. Bill was excited and they were off to the races. There was a problem though. They couldn't get a game console to run full Windows and work well as a game console, or work well for anything for that matter. February 14, 2000, a meeting with Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer was scheduled. The meeting would be known as the Valentine's Day Massacre. The room was filled with other execs who would get to watch a free WWE Monday Night Raw type effect. Seeing the promise of windows in the living room stripped out of the box, Bill was pissed. What ensued in this meeting was a multi-hour smackdown of Bill yelling how this was a disgrace to his legacy and an affront to everything he built with his company, followed by Steve Ballmer yelling about the financials and logistics of making such an atrocity. The Xbox team kept yelling back and for hours they got nowhere. Each point and counterpoint prompted more yelling, until one of the spectators in the peanut gallery asked a simple question. What about Sony? This prompted Bill Gates to remember the original question. What if Sony boxed them out with a PlayStation? Microsoft's presence in the living room hung in the balance. Microsoft's future hung in the balance. Bill and Steve immediately told the team, you have whatever you need, get it done. An impossible feat was accomplished, and a year and a half later, the Xbox would release to a pretty decent success, thanks to a killer exclusive game, Halo. A year after release in 2002, Microsoft would bring gaming over broadband internet into the living room with their Xbox Live service. Despite having to pay to play, it was a huge success. While they had a huge uphill battle, Microsoft proved they had what it took to make it in the games industry, and they brought the internet into the living room. Everything was going according to plan. Not to be outdone, Microsoft rushed production of their successor to beat the PS3 to market in 2005 and the Xbox 360 on the surface would look to be a huge success and the delivery of the original promise to Bill Gates. This machine would be capable of playing games, movies, and music. It could play DVDs and would have an external drive attachment for HD DVD as the world was moving to high-def television. It was set to become the entertainment hub in the living room. On top of that, Sony's hubris had them announce an over-engineered, overpriced, over spec console. It was incredibly hard to develop games for and was overpriced for most consumers. A Blu-ray would eventually win out over the HD DVD format, the PS3 was a dud at launch. They practically handed Microsoft the leadership position on a silver platter. The only problem, the original run of 360s had an almost 100% fail rate. The box had a faulty design that led to that dreaded red ring of death. Microsoft had to spend more than a billion dollars to save the brand. The upside, the Xbox brand would survive. They made all the right moves to fix the problem and make it right with consumers. In 2007, Don Matrick would take over as head of Xbox and would lead the team to go after the casual market like Nintendo was doing. They had online functionality to a simple game like Uno, created the Kinect where your voice and body were the controller, and the Xbox became a place to buy movies and TV. To top it all off, Xbox became the first exclusive set-top device to be able to stream Netflix in the living room. Microsoft's dream was coming true. They were owning the living room. That is, until they overplayed their hand. For a moment, Microsoft forgot their core audience. They thought they had the device that everyone would want. It was voice and motion activated, would sit in the living room, and gamers and non-gamers alike would want to use it. The problem, they made the same mistake that Sony made just six years earlier. Their hubris got the better of them. Gamers saw an always-on device that severely limited what they could do with their games, and your average non-gaming ma and pa weren't about to drop $500 for a Blu-ray player slash Netflix machine they could yell at. Microsoft made a box no one wanted, but can you entirely blame them? This was the reason they got into the market to begin with. Nintendo was trying to make a similar play with the Wii U. Does anybody remember the Nintendo TV? Sony clobbered Microsoft with the PS4, and they had to make a lot of corrections to woo back that core Xbox audience. Which leaves us where we are today. 
The Xbox Series systems are on par in price with the PS5, yet the PS5 is still outselling them significantly. Sony is still winning. And Microsoft is having trouble convincing players to buy an Xbox for what few exclusive games they have, or keep exclusive on their platform. Even buying Bethesda and having Starfield exclusivity isn't cutting it at the moment. And as enticing as Game Pass is, it's not showing great signs of viability for the long term. Xbox bought Bethesda and Activision, making them the biggest publisher in the games business. And Games Pass is extremely consumer friendly, but the business model doesn't appear to be shaking out quite yet. And it's not really moving console sales like Microsoft had hoped. So what's keeping them in the console business? They pretty much lost the living room to Sony, haven't they? Maybe. But it's not just Sony they have to contend with. They're just a small portion. Google has been assaulting Microsoft on all fronts this past decade. Android boxed them out of the mobile OS market. Gmail, Google Docs, and the whole G Suite is cutting into their Office product line. And Google tried their hand at gaming of Stadia, and, well, they abandoned that pretty quickly. Amazon has their Fire devices, they're experimenting with cloud gaming with Luna, and their Prime service has exclusive content. Then there's also Apple with their Apple TV Plus content. Xbox was ahead of the game back in 2013. The time just wasn't right for Xbox Entertainment Studios. I think Microsoft's biggest concern right now is an old competitor, Apple. While Apple was on the verge of collapse back in the 90s, Steve Jobs' return saw Apple become a force to be reckoned with. They rode the coattails of change that Napster started and saved the music industry with the iPod and iTunes. They then repositioned the Mac to be a formidable foe against the PC, taking a large chunk out of Windows market share. And then they led the way into the mobile computing space. Apple has a product with software and services for just about any use you could think of. They have the iPhone and iPad for telecommunications and mobile computing, the Mac line of computers for work and some play, and the Apple TV 4K brings all your streaming services and digital movie purchases into the living room. And most recently, I believe Apple is making a big play for gaming. They're just not showing their hand yet. The PS2 was a theoretical Trojan horse. I believe the Apple TV is a real Trojan horse. One Microsoft should be very, very, very worried about. For that matter, so should Sony and Nintendo. To me, this is as plain as day. They've got the infrastructure there, and Resident Evil Village and Death Stranding, these are their test subjects. For Death Stranding, some are wondering who's gonna wanna play that on their phone? You wanna play that in the comfort of your living room or at least your gaming computer in the den, right? The play here isn't for the phone. The play is for playing anywhere. If you buy Death Stranding for your iPhone 15 Pro, you automatically have it for your Apple M chip iPads and Apple M chip Macintosh computers with cross-save functionality. So you could play on your iMac, save, head out the door, and continue on your iPhone while on the go. The current Apple TVs use an A15 Bionic chip, the same chip found in the iPhone 14. The Apple TV 4K? That's due for an upgrade soon. I think we'll get one this year. And something tells me it's launching at least with the same chip as the iPhone 15 Pro. If not, the same chip that will power the next iPhones later this year. The next Apple TV is going to be able to play Death Stranding. And whatever other game they announce, it'll be coming to Apple Silicon. Apple's going to make a move, and I bet it'll be this year. And it's going to be a really affordable set-top device. Microsoft needs to keep the Xbox in play. They need to figure out how to grow their market share because Microsoft's presence in the living room is being assaulted from multiple fronts. And they need to figure out how to hang on. They're obviously willing to throw ridiculous amounts of money at this brand. Beyond saving the Xbox 360, they bought two huge publishers and Minecraft, making that money used to save the 360 look like chump change. With all this competition coming from all sides, I don't think they're gonna hang their hats just yet. I'm just curious, what are they gonna do? In my humble opinion, I think while Sony will release a PS5 Pro, I think Microsoft is going to go for broke and move on to a new generation. Now. There's some exciting stuff coming out in hardware that we're going to share this holiday. And we're also invested in the next generation roadmap. And what we're really focused on there is delivering the largest technical leap you will have ever seen in a hardware generation, which makes it 
better for players and better for creators and the visions that they're building.